Time now for our weekly roundtable discussion of some of the week's top stories. Tonight we will be looking at the impending troop surge in Afghanistan and a date set by President Obama to start withdrawing the troops. And the unusual vote in Switzerland to ban the construction of minarets. Some are asking, will the mosques themselves be next? Joining us tonight, Nicholas Christoph, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the New York Times and co-author of Half the Sky, and Garrick Utley, former NBC News foreign correspondent and anchor. He is now president of the Levin Institute of the State University of New York. Welcome to both of you. Thank nice you. to see you. Thank you. Nick, let me start with you first of all. Uh, president Obama's troop uh, surge plan for Afghanistan, good idea? I think it was a bad idea, and I'm struck by how many people who have actually spent time in rural Afghanistan, especially in the Pashtun areas in the south, who think that uh, it is perhaps going to make things worse and at least isn't going to help. One issue is the cost. I mean, we will now be spending more money uh, militarily in Afghanistan than the entire military budget of any other country outside the U.S. I mean, it's $100 billion a year is a vast amount of money. Uh, and on top of that, there is this sense that over the last few years, whenever we sent more troops into an area, the result has indeed been a stronger Taliban, more of an uprising, and a greater sense among the Pashtuns that they need to fight off an occupation. And so I'm afraid that uh, we're gonna, this is going to feed the insurgency rather than quell it. Mm. Do you th what do you think, well, to surge it, or not to surge? History clearly says it's not a good idea. We know what's happened to other foreign uh, armies. They're not just the Soviets going back much further. Um, in many ways, it was a political speech. It was a political speech to meet a security issue. And the political speech was formatted that way. So on the one hand, he get enough Democrat support, enough Republican support, show that he is the strong national security president. On the other hand, he could also be, excuse the expression, the general who marches his troops up the hills and then one day marches them down. What that date is going to be, I don't know. Significantly, he did not mention the word victory. Uh, in it. He did not really define what success would be, and he did not talk about nation building. So it's this very opaque, vague situation. Of course, uh, Secretaries Clinton and Gates were following this up with the small print, so to speak. Well, yes, we'll start the withdrawal in mid-2011, uh, but then we're going into a political election year, Obama's re-election year, and he will be able to gauge both from security uh, point of view and politics right. how so fast overall, they come Overall, where, where do you think the strategy is going, though? Well, I mean, I, I, my theory is that we're putting all our eggs in the military basket. And in fact, development has tended to work rather better in the region. And I think we're, there are simply missed opportunities. For example, in Pakistan, there are about one and a half million kids who are in the madrasas in a channel that is lead, leading them toward militancy. For about the price of maybe 20 soldiers, we could uh, offer all of those kids in the madrasas actual real schooling, take them out of that channel. But that is something that we have completely failed to do. And instead, um, you know, we're going to send those 20 soldiers into Afghanistan betting on a military solution, which I think so far has been a mistake. Right. And in order for the plan to be a success, how important do you think it is um, to end government corruption in Afghanistan? Well, it's essential, this obviously, being tackled. to have a credible, effective government. Can you do that? Is this question mark that large? Uh, the other part of it, uh, picking up on Nick's point, is that even if troops are withdrawn, how do civilian American or other foreign workers operate there if they don't have anybody to reliable forces to protect them and if the Afghan forces are not able to do it? They're going to be too exposed. And then nothing gets done along but, the lines that Nick was describing. But, but are we holding uh, Hamid Karzai's feet to the fire, so to speak, and telling him to, to give us a concrete plan for how he intends to clean up corruption? I mean, I think the Obama administration is very much trying to hold Karzai's feet to the fire. The problem is that we don't have a lot of leverage because I think the perception on both sides there is that we want to be in Afghanistan more than they want us there. And when you make that clear, then you lose all your leverage. Well, let's move on to this other story that we've been covering on the program, the controversial uh, vote in Switzerland to ban the construction of minarets. Is this something that came as a surprise to either of you? Of course it came as a surprise. Uh, suddenly there it was, the, probably the most important story or significant story we've heard or read about out of Switzerland in many a year, if not a decade. When you read the details, it's interesting. I think there are only about four minarets in Switzerland, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, they're only planning two more. But it, it's interesting also, I think, because here's Switzerland in a world where 
where language divisions, cultural divisions cause so much strife and conflict within countries. It has four cultures and four languages, and they've done this for centuries, living peacefully, and suddenly um, this issue has arisen. So Switzerland is not the perfect society. Right. Nick, what, what, what do you make of the vote? What do you think it also tells us in terms of the bigger picture about how uh, Muslims are viewed yeah. in Europe? Well, I mean, clearly the subtext is a uh, changing perception over the longer run uh, to, and a deep disquiet in Europe. That Traditionally, it was people on the far right who were nervous about growing Muslim populations in Europe. And then over time, you've had people in more liberal countries and indeed liberals in those countries. Uh, I'm thinking about, um, about the Netherlands, for example being increasingly concerned about the fact that in some cities like Rotterdam, you have uh, Marseille, you have almost a quarter of the population that is Muslim, mm -hmm. and bringing in uh, practices that often t to people there seem inimical to a modern liberal society. And coupled with the concern that fertility among uh, most Europeans is declining, uh, but fertility among uh, Muslim Europeans is very high in a sense. I think among a lot of people that we're losing our country, and I think that but, but, is. But is, it, is that is that based in any kind of fact based? Is it rational? Well, it's a different or is it cultural a and historical base. Europe is not the United States. I mean, we don't have these issues here because we are a land of, with an immigration and migration history. That's who and what we are, and it's amazing how we've absorbed uh, groups from every part of the world, including Muslims, uh, successfully. In Europe, you've had, you don't have that tradition, and as Nick was saying, many of these people who came in, they've been workers, it goes back to the 1950s and 60s with the first Turkish workers going to Holland and Germany and Scandinavia, and it's a different, different situation. It's exactly right. I mean, I, my dad actually was an Eastern European refugee and initially settled in France, and he was planning to stay there. He spoke French. It would have been easier, but he felt that as a Romanian, he would never fit in. In, uh, in France, and his children might not either. And so we came to America. And mm -hmm. there is that sense of identity that may, creates a certain amount of skepticism, I don't want to say hostility, but something mm -hmm. toward that, toward uh, foreigners. And I think that is what we're running again to, against in a number of these countries. And okay. to pay off again, as we have a first class journalist and columnist here, you see. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, Nicholas Kristof, thank you very much for joining us. Gary Cutley, good to see you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.